Hi, it's Craig here this week in the studio, and um, and Richard's uh, taking one for the team over in Bali at the moment. So perhaps uh, we could just have a little bit of a hello from Richard. Hi, everyone. Richard here. I'm actually in Bali right now. I've just been running a week-long mindfulness and self-compassion retreat. So as you can see, I'm, I'm doing it pretty tough in, up in Ubud next to the rice terraces. So it's uh, great to be with you on this uh, week three feedback video. And uh, a lot of interesting, important, and uh, sometimes quite challenging topics come up. Self-criticism has been a bit of a theme of the week. And, uh, and the mindfulness really makes us aware of... Uh, how much self-criticism, that sort of internal commentary, the default mode, judging, criticizing, um, it, it really becomes apparent to us. One of the really interesting things is that a number of learners have noticed that as soon as we notice the self-criticism, then the mind criticizes that as well, <laughs> which is just like the mind doing the same thing. Oh, I hate it when I criticize. But it's um, it's just really the mind just, um, I suppose, just uh, coming back to the same thing. But you know, it, often things like rumination, worry, self-criticism get a lot of attention because they masquerade as something useful, like it pretends to be self-improvement when it's just judging and, um, uh, and in many ways dragging us down and consuming a lot of energy and time. And uh, so it, it pretends to be more useful than it is, and that's what often draws our attention to it and means that we kind of feed it and think that we're going to get something valuable out of it. So if we can cultivate a bit of mindfulness, we, we might sort of notice, well, it doesn't actually produce necessarily, necessarily anything very useful, but it does consume a lot of energy and time, but it also it creates a kind of a residual um, unhelpful sort of um, emotional state. We often find that we withdraw and cut off from others and, uh, and get even more distracted. So the noticing the self-criticism, if in the first step we could just practice, um, noticing it in a kind of a gentle and perhaps curious sort of way and uh, and to not to dive into the next thing is why do I criticize so much and you know and and to start ruminating about that but just to notice the criticism in a kind of a gentle way but just to sort of in a sense let it go uh, just to gently re-engage the attention with where we are and what we're doing um, that's a that's a very helpful thing but the it's it is common and I think this is one of the really supportive things that, uh, you know, when, when the learners, so many of learners have shared about, um, you know, noticing the self-criticism, we realize how common it is. We don't have this to ourselves. And, and that, on one level, is quite comforting. It's kind of, in a sense, it's not natural, um, but it becomes second nature, that is, habitual. And the, ha the word habit is an interesting word in itself. It means a cover, a cover over something. And what it does is it covers our real nature, which is, not critical, which is compassionate, which is patient, uh, which is uh, altogether wiser than uh, often the stuff that's going on in the surface that's covering that. Um, now, one of the things um, uh, about, uh, I suppose, learning to parent ourselves better, because we do pick up a lot of baggage from the past, and, and we become more aware of that as we cultivate mindfulness. But as, as many learners have noticed, we, we, we do start to have a choice about whether we keep on feeding this or not. And that choice is a really important one to, um, to, to realize is there and to start to exercise. Now, as some have discussed, and I think reasonably so, that um, can we develop a kind of constructive self-criticism? And the hallmarks of that might be a kind of impartiality, a kind of objectivity. It's a, just a kind of a noticing. It'd be like sitting back and just watching what's going on in a kind of a curious sort of way and seeing what works and what doesn't work, what's the effect of one thing, what's the effect of something else. Um, but as soon as the ego gets involved, as soon as we start to take it personally, we, we get caught in it, we elaborate on it and so on, then we just get more and more knotted up. But if we're able to stand back and just sort of watch it, just sort of notice it, just be curious about it, that's interesting is a lot better than that sucks, you know, just to sort of be interested then we might start to learn a little bit about what's going on and that, that choice will be exercised in a more discerning kind of way. Um, one of the things too about um, stress and criticism is we often use it as a motivator. And I suppose it is more motivating than apathy, complete non-engagement. There's an interesting study recently um, came out and it created a few headlines about uh, mindfulness reduces motivation. And, uh, but the, the thing was, the authors, uh, the study, were measuring motivation in terms of 
a, a kind of anxiety about wanting things to be different. And um, as we become more mindful, we're able to be more accepting of how things are. Now, being accepting of how things are, being accepting of the fact that we're lost, for example, doesn't mean that we don't take the steps to actually get ourselves out of that situation. But we do have to accept things as they are. And this is a, a common confusion that people have, that, well, acceptance, that means apathy, I won't get anything done. No, that's not the kind of thing. But the capacity to accept things as they are and then to engage, then to, as it were, to, to get on task and to respond to what's in front of us on its merits is a very helpful thing. And the kind of motivation that comes from mindfulness is not driven by anxiety so much, but is more driven by interest, by commitment. Um, that's why it's so much a part of ACT, acceptance commitment therapy, for example, and how mindfulness can help to reinforce that. Because the stress certainly comes at a cost, especially when it gets very high. As we've discussed previously, it really impairs performance. So the cultivation of self-compassion um, has been a really useful thing that many learners have um, been practicing and encouraging others to practice, uh, especially repeat learners um, might have noticed how difficult it was initially to do that, but how it's getting a lot easier to do that now. Um, and, and also noticing the, the nature of the internal dialogue, the, the should, I should this, I should that, I should something else. And um, there's a lot of shooting goes on, and that, that really has its own particular uh, negative impact. There's a term given to, to uh, some of this, the, the things that become apparent to us when we become more mindful, um, backdraft, which is a term used by Kristen Neff. And, and Richard's um, go, uh, got some really interesting uh, insights and, um, and things to say about that. One of, the, one of the questions that came up this week was around backdraft, and, the, and that's one of the big things that we've been exploring here on the retreat. Because we've been taking people really deeply into practices of mindfulness and self-compassion and learning to be with vulnerability, with, with love and presence, or as Krista Neff would say, with mindfulness, self-kindness and a sense of common humanity. And one of the things that happens when we do that is we often get in touch with things that, uh, that have been needing care or presence or love for a long time. And quite often we start to feel those things much more fully. And so, you know, once when, when people do that, and this has been happening on this retreat, when, when people do that, quite often it adds some oxygen to something that's been starved for a long time. And some of those feelings, those, those emotions or that sense of vulnerability really shows itself. And that's just a really important part of the process. And so when we practice these, these things that we're doing in, in this course, you know, if, if we start to feel, you know, triggered, strong emotion, vulnerable, that's, that's a sign that the, the practices are doing their work. And, and we really want to welcome that. At the same time, of course, we want to go slowly. We don't want to jump headlong into something or, or work with material that's too hard for us. But we do want to allow difficult, difficulties to arise as long as we can stay present and keep being kind and compassionate with ourselves. And we've noticed in this course, actually, that some of these exercises, particularly in this week, start to bring up really challenging experiences for people. And if that's you, just be aware that that's normal. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's a natural part of this. And you could almost see it as a good thing. You know? But as I said, just taking it slowly and being respectful to yourself and, and, and always staying in your own limits. Man, Bali looks good. I think I might just go there myself. <laughs> so so um, still in the studio, but just pretending I'm in Bali. Um, so the uh, cultivating of self-compassion um, with difficulties when facing difficulties exercise has been um, uh, both insightful and, and challenging for many as well. And, um, and it really is something that we need to, in a sense, uh, come, in, come back to. We need to practice it a few times because you know, it, it can be challenging and it's not necessarily easy. I mean, it, the principles are simple, but it's not necessarily easy. And uh, so if we can just be patient with ourselves and um, realize that it takes time. A question's come up about, well, does it go on forever? You know, like, is this never ending, um, having to cultivate um, compassion? Well, not necessarily. It just really depends on... Um, on uh, how long it takes for us to lose our interest in self-criticism uh, and to think of it's a value. Because if we lose our interest in it and we realize that it's of uh, little value, as opposed to, you know, objective self-appraisal, that's a different thing, 
But as soon as we lose our interest in it, then it'll very quickly start to um, recede in terms of how influential it is in our lives. Um, practicing things like gratitude. And you see, the use of attention um, is very helpful because we can start to choose specific things to give attention to, thoughts or feelings that we want to actually practice cultivating, like gratitude, for example. So giving attention to not only acknowledging the things for which we're grateful every day and, and really uh, we often don't notice or we don't um, acknowledge them, but there are many things every day we could be grateful for, but to actually uh, consciously cultivate um, that attitude of um, gratitude. And so that, uh, of course, rewires the brain. We wire out the stress and the self-criticism and the distraction, etc., but we wire in the things that we want to cultivate in our lives. Uh, one of the other topics for the week as well relates to pain and, uh, and meditation. And um, now a, a question around, is it, uh, is it about controlling our pain or is it the reactions to it? And two of the things that happen with um, especially chronic pain and strong chronic pain is there's um, a hypervigilance for it. So we're, in a sense, constantly monitoring for it. So the, there's like a preoccupation about it. So, so that's sometimes called hypervigilance. And, uh, and then emotional reactivity when it's noticed. And mind you, it's not just with physical pain. It could be the same with emotional pain or any symptom that we find um, uh, uncomfortable in some way, tinnitus in the ears and so on. But um, so the hypervigilance and the emotional reactivity and what that does is the emotional reactivity fixates the attention on it even more so it dominates the attention and the amount of suffering associated with it uh, increases significantly. Now the mindfulness um, in a sense it's not about trying to make it go away or pretending it's not there but we can start to, as it were, ration the attention to it. So it might be there, like the hum of the uh, air conditioning or heating might be in the background, but do we need to pay attention to it or not? Mm. It's there, but I'm preferring to give my attention to something else. And what mindfulness seems to do, and the research shows this in the brain, it's much more effective than a placebo, but it actually uh, changes the areas of the brain that, that regulate whether or not to, to allow those messages to go through to higher levels. So the it's, it's like reducing the hypervigilance and also helping a person to cultivate more acceptance and gentleness so that reducing the emotional reactivity and so the suffering associated with the pain goes down quite significantly. Um, so because certainly mindfulness will make us aware of the effect of fear or anger or frustration of course amplifies that. And just an, another interesting um, thing that's been noted as well, and, and many learners will probably recognize this, is that um, when we're in a situation like in the dentist chair and um, we don't want to be there, our mind's sort of, oh, I want to be somewhere else, um, the, the, the pain and the suffering associated with any physical sensation there, even if it's not that painful, the, the suffering associated with it can be enormous. Whereas you step into a, a situation where um, you actually want to be there. Now, somebody was giving an example of going to a tattoo parlor. It may not be everybody's cup of tea, but um, so, but you actually make a decision you want to be there. It's for a reason that you're, um, uh, you want to be there. Or, or in sport, you know, people endure discomfort and challenge, and, you know, especially in things like full contact sports. But in a sense, we're turning attention to the situation. We're engaging with it. There's a kind of positive attitude of openness to the situation and of course as many would notice the amount of suffering associated with that is significant in fact there's enjoyment um, of the sport for example uh, with a background level of physical discomfort that we entirely um, acknowledge as a part of the experience and so it really has much to do with the attitude that we take to something when we're experiencing it anyway it's been a very interesting week um, just a little bit of a goodbye from uh, Richard so that's all from me this week. Um, I'll be back in the studio next week for our final feedback video and we look forward to hearing about your experiences. Um, so please keep sharing, please keep supporting one another on the forums and see you next week. And it's going to be goodbye from me as well and we'll be both in the studio next week. And please remember for all of our learners that mindfulness, uh, it's, it's about awareness. It does bring things up at, uh, at certain times. So. Go gently, go at your own pace.
and always remember that um, uh, that if you ever feel like you need some help or support, then please do avail yourself of that, not only in terms of family or friends that might be supportive, but sometimes you might need to speak to a professional as well. And uh, But we'll look forward to both being in the studio next week. I'm not sure what backdrop we'll have, but it uh, might be something quite exotic, who knows. But um, have a great week, and we'll look forward to um, week four feedback video in a week from now. Awesome. Perfect. Good.